character descriptions are hard to write. You could almost say, Character descriptions are complicated! So, I've been studying 35 character descriptions by brilliant authors across a ton of genres, why they work and what we can learn from them. And what I learned from them personally, because I kind of struggle with character descriptions too, and maybe at the end of the video I'll even show you some of my writing. Yeah. I am only able to take the time to research this- Hello Momo. <sighs> take the time to research this kind of video because of patrons, so thank you. Now we will only be looking at 16 of the 35 descriptions that I studied today. But my analysis of all 35, what we can learn from them, stuff that didn't make it into this video is available to all patrons. If you would like that extra analysis for the books we discuss now and entirely original notes as well on books like A Game of Thrones, Lolita, Paper Towns, The Book Thief, or you just like to support me and your Supreme Empress Momo, then uh, it's all available there. Thanks again. Part 1. Vivid Physical Descriptions. You know vivid character descriptions do not just come from describing a list of random physical features, because not only do physical attributes of your character like height, eye colour, or shoulder shape not really matter that much by themselves, but readers can find it hard to remember a lot of them. So just heaving a slew of adjectives and nouns at the reader doesn't even help them get to know the character that much. Her leafy green bulbous round eyes were so moon-like. Her dark, long hair was like a luscious, tall, dark waterfall on a dark night. Her curvy, wavy, round hips were so ready for childbearing. This is why in Save the Cat, Blake Snyder advocates for highlighting a single or few memorable or distinguishing features that set a character apart, like a limp or an eye patch he calls it. So let's look at how William Gibson uses this technique in his foundational cyberpunk short story, Burning Chrome. Chrome. Her pretty childlike face smooth as steel, with eyes that would have been at home on the bottom of some deep Atlantic trench, cold grey eyes that lived under terrible pressure. They said she cooked her own cancers for people who crossed her. The focus here is on her distinctive dark eyes that hint at her darker nature, and a vivid image forms around them, a limp or an eye patch. But Gibson actually does more than just this. See, unlike the film medium, I as a writer cannot get you to perfectly envision my characters the way I do, and spending endless words trying to do so just isn't worth it. Beyond that, it actually undermines the reader's ability to engage with the text on their own terms, to imagine things in their own way, which is one of the real strengths of the textual medium. So instead, Gibson contrasts other characters with Chrome two other times with wildly different descriptions of the same thing. Their eyes. Characters are very simply separated in our minds this way. But it's also worth noting that her eyes aren't actually that abnormal. A distinctive feature can be freckles from childhood that haven't melted away, auburn hair that glitters at sunset, or skin that becomes a patchwork of pink and cream in the summer sun. Normal stuff, but something that marks them out nonetheless. No other characters have eyes as dark as hers, and I reckon that was intentional. You'll also notice the strength of the adjectives, metaphors, and similes. Chrome doesn't just have dark grey eyes, but cold grey eyes that lived under terrible pressure. The first describes them factually, while the second brings in other connotations, like that Chrome is calculating, conniving, and necessarily ruthless. Consider the words that you use and ask, are you just stating the facts, or are you giving other connotations about the character? And that's why it's worth noting that when I studied these descriptions, just how much I found that great description didn't come from hair or eyes, but with part two. Posture, movement, and facial expressions. F. Scott Fitzgerald actually describes Gatsby almost entirely through his smile in his introduction. He smiled understandingly, much more than understandingly. It was one of those rare smiles with a quality of eternal reassurance in it that you may come across four or five times in life. It faced, or seemed to face, the whole eternal world for an instant and then concentrated on you with an irresistible prejudice in your favor. I know how tempting it is to just describe physical features because we want them to know what they look like, but sometimes facial expressions, movement, and posture can do a way better job at communicating character. Charles Dickens conjures an image of Scrooge just from saying he was a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. 
nearly entirely movement. And this is all because of something that just became so apparent to me as I studied all of these descriptions. That the best ones didn't just tell us what the characters looked like with fancy and pretty words, they- Part 3. Tell us about who they are. It's always going to be a mixture of their eyes, their body shape, how they move, their posture, their scars, their freckles. Descriptions will have some, but not others, with each different character. I mean, none of these books had everything, and trying to give it all is futile. And I think that's because the authors of all of these descriptions figured out that it's not about communicating the most information. That instead, it's about knowing and choosing which things best tell us about their character. You know, in Burning Chrome, it was her dark eyes. In The Library of Auschwitz, it's Hirsch's posture, the way he moves. In The Great Gatsby, it's his smile. Focusing purely on the looks of a character is a relatively surface level way of getting to know them, but what you choose to show and how you describe it can show the reader deeper things. Their psychological state, their flaws, their worldview, their personality, thought patterns, anything. Let's look at some examples of how. Some unexplained accident had taken the other eye, and the missing orb had been replaced by a ball of glass. The result was disconcerting. But what bothered Lord Downey far more was the man's other eye, the one which might be loosely called normal. He'd never seen such a small and sharp pupil. Tea Time looked at the world through a pinhole. Not only does Pratchett here focus on describing a single distinctive physical characteristic like we discussed, his eyes, but the way he describes it leans into how Mr. Tiataime hyper-focuses on things. He becomes obsessed with things to a fault, and he views the world through that very narrow lens, in other words, he looked at the world through a pinhole. I mean, Martin's not known for exactly being concise, but in A Game of Thrones, Martin doesn't describe the inscription on King Robert's armor or the color of his eyes, but instead focuses on how he smells, how fat he is, his unkempt beard, because they highlight his flaws. He has become lazy and more concerned with pleasure than ruling the kingdom. Which things you choose to describe, and how you describe them, can communicate so much about the character to the reader. So don't just look for distinctive visual features, but features that come from their quirks, their flaws, their strengths, beliefs, and struggles. A wedding ring isn't distinctive by itself, unless the man's wife has already been dead for 30 years and he can't let her go. But I want to highlight something, okay? I want to highlight just how many of these descriptions and more were made so potent by using character bias. Things the perspective character wants, that they hate, that they believe in will shape what they focus on and how they describe it, especially in first person and third person limited. It's a little bit different when it's a narrator outside of them. A great example of this is in Amy Bender's short story, What You Left in the Ditch, a story about a wife whose husband loses his lips in an explosion while on military duty. He's unable to kiss her and she begins to resent him for that. So when she's out, she's describing another man and she says, the young man there had always had lips, but now they seem twice as large and full and incredible, as if his face was overflowing with lip. While he ran her milk and eggs and toothpaste over the electronic sensor, she couldn't stop looking at them. Guess what they tasted like? The warm, salty taste of flesh. How she describes this other man tells us less about him than it does about her. Her perspective created a bias to describe the man's lips. It's dehumanizing the way she does it. She doesn't even give him a name, it's just carnal and primal. This description of someone else captures her desire for the taste of flesh in a kiss. And the way she frames them may not even be true. I know I like to focus on a character's thoughts, their feelings, their features, but so much of characterization comes from how a character interacts with the things and people around them. In Patricia McCormick's cut, Kelly describes a number of girls at the hospital struggling with mental illness like her, and the way she does it tells us about Kelly's psychological state. Our problems are called issues. The rest, like me, are assorted psychos. We're called guests with behavioral issues. And the place is called a residential treatment facility. It is not called a loony bin. Tara, a skinny girl who has to wear a baseball cap to cover a bald spot where her hair fell out, and Becca, another really skinny girl who wears little girl tights that pull around her ankles. 
By defining others around her by traits that identify their mental illnesses, it tells us that she is also defining herself by her struggles and self-harm. There's also this emphasis on labels, and a big part of Kelly's arc in the story is coming to see herself as more than that, that label. And these carrots descriptions help to set that up. McCormick shows us that you can give descriptions of really standard bodily features like body shapes and hair, but the description is really about communicating Kelly's struggles. In both of these cases, how someone else is described is used to characterise the narrator, what the wife craves in the first and Kelly's psychological state in the second. What biases, concerns, jealousies, memories do your characters have and how do those things A affect which features they describe in others or themselves and B how they describe them. This is especially true for first person writing where we're already inside their head but as is what's the case with what you left in the ditch it's also very true for third person limited. It's a little bit different when it comes to an omnipotent narrator but it can affect that as well. I mean everyone knows the laughable YA trait of the main character randomly looking in the mirror and describing themselves in excessive detail. <laughs> I wouldn't usually look at myself in the mirror, but that day I did for some reason. I was very normal. My hair was exactly the colour I remembered it was. Somehow, my eyes were too. But at least I had my curvaceous hips ready for childbearing. People just don't do that, they don't think like that. But this is a challenge. How do you describe your narrator when writing in first person? It's hard. I looked at quite a few examples of this, but I think that Ned Vizzini's It's Kind of a Funny Story actually does this really well. It's a story about someone who has growing urges to kill themselves, and yes, unsurprisingly, I read a lot of books about mental health, and this happens as those thoughts escalate. I look so normal. I look like I've always looked. Like I did before the fall of last year. Dark hair and dark eyes, and one snaggled tooth, big eyebrows that meet in the middle, a long nose, sort of twisted, pupils that are naturally large, which blend into the dark brown to make two big saucer eyes, holes in me. This is Craig, and I always look like I'm about to cry. I love that expression, holes in me. The language here invokes feelings that reflect Craig's emotional state. In the first part, there's the sense of being stuck, immobile, unable to escape. I think the key though is in the second part. Vizzini leans heavily into using Craig's biases, what he thinks of himself in particular. Craig is berating himself for his looks, only describes things in a negative way and focuses on negative things because of this self-loathing that he feels, which all builds into those suicidal urges. Shalem Bishop leans into those biases in a different way, by having the character compare themselves to a girl they wish was their daughter in I Will Never Tell You This. Black braids, blue raincoat, gumboots, ten years old. Your daughter moved like an otter, with curious seal. But she had my hair, glossy like oil, dark eyes like mine, skin beige like mine, a young face still easily attributed to me. To everyone but you, we could have been father and daughter. In both cases, the first person narrator has strong personal reasons for pointing out a detailed physical description. If they don't have that, I found a lot of authors just tone it back or throw in a few features every so often throughout the book where they fit. This is why Suzanne Collins basically only gives us one feature of Katniss in her introduction, her braid. She didn't have a reason to give much else and just threw other things in along the way later on. Th it wasn't that important. You don't need a big complex reason to describe something, no. But it is worth recognising when a character wouldn't give a slew of details like this. And this is why, as much as I love John Green, I actually think his description of Miles in Looking for Alaska is lacking. He seems to draw a connection between Miles' desire to find a great perhaps and this physical description. As the dribbling shower slowly soaked my body, I wondered whether I could find a great perhaps here at all, or whether I had made a grand miscalculation. But I couldn't quite decipher what that connection is. It doesn't seem to inform that desire or communicate the struggle with the great perhaps, making this description feel kind of forced, just for the benefit of the reader. But I also found a huge number of descriptions did more than just talk about the character. They Part 4. Tell us about everything around them. This could mean their relationships, the setting, or even theme in a few cases. I actually just finished Margaret Atwood's The Testaments, and I was astounded with the finesse with how she somehow opened her book with a character description that gripped me. 
Only the dead are allowed to have statues, but I had been given one while still alive. Already, I am petrified. This statue was a small token of appreciation for my many contributions, said the citation. We don't do cheering here in Ardua Hall, but there was discreet clapping. I inclined my head in a nod. My statue is larger than life, as statues tend to be, and shows me as younger, slimmer, and in better shape than I've been for some time. I am standing straight, shoulders back, my lips curved into a firm but benevolent smile. My eyes are fixed on some cosmic point of reference understood to represent my idealism, my unflinching commitment to duty, my determination to move forward despite all obstacles. It gives us a physical description by drawing connections between how she looks and how how those looks fit in with the principles of Gilead society. In other words, she's setting the scene and atmosphere and world building this dim reality. This is a restrictive world of unflinching duty and order before kindness. This contrast between her and her statue also introduces a core element of the novel, the difference between how she is perceived publicly and how she truly thinks. In a short story, Winnow, Hanley Kidder uses a description to talk about how two girls have each changed after their breakup. Her hair has grown a lot, almost to her hips. There's the half-moon scar. She's paler than she was last I saw her too, not sickly looking, just not as sunned. It makes her green eyes stand out. When I'm not tan, you can see the blue veins running beneath my skin and dark circles under my eyes. I look like that now. She looks porcelain. Her eyelashes flutter as she takes in the room, eyes landing on me. She glides over, unrushed and graceful. She must have been in the shop for a while because her arms feel warm through both our long sleeves. The perspective character here lingers on details from memory, like the half-moon scar, and dwells on her warmth. It's a little awkward because there's this distinct sense of longing from one side. Kidder also uses juxtaposition as a technique here, with the girl's eyes, to show that one has it together and the other one doesn't. How she describes doesn't just show us what these girls look like, but how they've each changed since their relationship. I also want to give you two weirder examples of character descriptions that are used to develop theme or concept. T.R. Napper's A Strange Loop, and Patrick Ness's The Rest of Us Just Live Here. He had a full head of silver hair that probably wasn't real, and a movie star chin that most definitely wasn't. The gold of the heavy chain around his wrist? That would be real. The doctor looked 40, but he stank of money, probably closer to 60. The doctor gave him the perfect imitation of a smile, his pristine white teeth matching the room. A Strange Loop deals with to what degree a person is real or authentic in a world where you can sell or get rid of memories. There's a terrible irony to him describing the Doctor this way. He sees the man as fake, like society often does with these sorts of things, but he does not realise he is becoming less real himself by selling his memories to this corporation in this story. Nappa does something quite clever here. He connects his theme to his main character's arc and world view, which affects how he describes others, which features he focuses on like the fake hair and fake smile. As the character slowly realises what he is losing and becoming as he sells his memories across the story. So how the MC describes others really does play into the thematic discussion of whether someone is real or authentic or fake. And this also intersects with content selection, what you choose to put in your story, because I'm sure Napa actually designed that doctor to look fake. It's not just a bias in how a character describes him, so you're not just thinking about how a character describing someone else can intersect with theme, but how physical appearance itself can intersect with theme. The second example is really weird, because Ness doesn't actually describe his main characters basically at all. And that's kind of the point. Uh, the gimmick of the story is that it's not really about the characters you would consider the main characters, they're the NPCs in the background. There's actually this secondary story about the quote indie kids, who he does describe in detail, but the characters that the story is actually about, well, their ordinariness is meant to be so pervasive that I think he was like, well, they're not really warranting much description at all. If you want to connect description to setting or world building, consider connecting a character's features to social norms, laws, principles, and beliefs that impact the character. Comparison and juxtaposition are great techniques for building relationships through description. Theme can come through in description when a character's biases and arc come from a discussion of that theme. And with all of this, I think that it's worth us looking at some Part 5, Structural Techniques. Things that might just help us pin down some more sentence-to-sentence -sentence stuff as to why these descriptions are so effective. 
An interesting one was used by Stieg Larsson in The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. For some reason, his description of Salander was so memorable to me, and I think I might know why. It's what I'm going to be calling the whiplash effect, because it kind of gives you that. Larson first gives a several page rundown of Salander's meticulous reporting and record keeping before he ever describes her physically. But that detailed description of her meticulous, agonizingly hardworking, no nonsense work ethic leads you to imagine an uptight pantsuit FBI agent type before he turns the tables on you and describes her suddenly as a pale, anorexic young woman who had hair as short as a fuse and a pierced nose and eyebrows. She had a wasp tattoo about an inch long on her neck, as though she had just emerged from a week-long orgy with a gang of hard rockers. Her movements were quick and spidery. Why does this work? Well, I think it might be kind of like how delivery exposition is more memorable if the characters were fully mistaken about something first, and then the truth is revealed. And that drastic shift in framing makes it more memorable. It's whiplash. By describing characteristics that really contrast with the reader's expectations of what they might look like, the reveal of their physical description can become a lot more memorable. A gentleman with massive muscles, a librarian drag queen, a really shy boy who towers over you. I've already mentioned a second technique, juxtaposition, where you put two contrasting features alongside one another to help them both stand out, like Hannah Lee Kidder did with those eyes of the two girls in Winnow. You can juxtapose different characters when comparing, juxtapose different parts of the same character's body, or juxtapose their body with theme, or world, or personality. The options are endless, and the end result is making it more memorable. A third is highlighting a special characteristic in its own sentence. Harry had a thin face, knobby knees, black hair, and bright green eyes. He wore round glasses, held together with a lot of scotch tape, because of all the times Dudley had punched him on the nose. The only thing Harry liked about his own appearance was a very thin scar on his forehead that was shaped like a bolt of lightning. Rolling signals to the reader here that the scar will be of some narrative importance by separating it out in its own sentence, helping the reader form their image of him around it. And she actually does this exact same structural thing in the Chamber of Secrets as well. She knows how this works. Things in a list like this can blur in the reader's mind, so if there is a feature that you want them to remember, then perhaps give it its own sentence or paragraph, or use stronger words to emphasize it above other features. I found this was relatively common in a lot of descriptions. Fourthly, I noticed a pattern in fast-paced scenes that used physical description. Movement, posture, facial expressions tend to be more contextually relevant to the scene at hand than your eyes, your hands, your curvaceous hips ready for childbearing. When things are moving quickly, movement, posture, and body shape tend to be more relevant to the action, whereas things like hair and eyes can kill the pacing if you just step apart from the story to talk about them. Not always, mind you, but you've got to keep asking what's relevant to the scene at hand, especially when you're trying to keep the pace up. Let's consider how Antonio Iturb introduces Hirsch in the fast-paced opening to the Librarian of Auschwitz. But Hirsch would smile. He was always smiling enigmatically, as if he knew something that no one else did. His eyes are locked on him. His nod is barely perceptible. Hirsch emerges from his tiny cubicle, pretending to be pleasantly surprised by the visit of the SS guards. Hirsch remains upright. The more they relax their posture, the more erect he'll be, to demonstrate the strength of the Jews. Antonio Iturbi characterizes Hirsch as an unshakable, weary, but warm-faced, smiling but firm, straight-backed man through his movement, expression, and posture, because they play into the scene at hand. They are simply more relevant. He's simultaneously showing the interaction with the SS guards and what it means for the characters in the story. But I want to take a step back and talk about something you might not have noticed. Just how few features are often physically described, like some of them only have one or two. And that's, by the way, not to say that you should only describe one or two. I'm just trying to get it that you don't need to feel compelled to paint a perfect picture. I mean, none of these guys did. And I think that's because these guys understood that they're not just describing characters for the sake of describing characters, that 
what they're doing is letting the reader get to know their characters. And sometimes physical description just doesn't factor into that. Hell, Agent Tchaikovsky doesn't give any physical description of the main perspective character of the opening chapter, who's also a main character later in the novel, at all. He entirely describes her through her thought patterns and speech patterns. And it works, because those are the best things to indicate her character. What really came through in all this is that we have to remember we're not just describing characters, we are introducing characters. And how you do this will be totally dependent on your personal style and taste as well. Part 6. My writing. <sighs> okay, nervous. Um, I actually learned a lot from researching this video. I went back and I looked at the character descriptions in my novel, and I found that they were somewhat lacking. So, I've never done this before because I'm pretty private about my writing, but uh, I want to show you a character description from my novel uh, before I made the changes and what it looks like afterwards with the tips and discussion from this video. I will not be revealing the title, I have changed the names, uh, but this is a piece from the novel that I hope to publish. This is the description before the changes. Her motley tweed jacket said everything you needed to know about her. It was held together a little haphazardly, all her own patchwork, ever one to fix a thing herself, old and wearing its age with pride. Her keys slacked around a larger ring as she walked, the kind you hear rattle before you're told it's time to go from the dungeon to the blocks. And this, well, this is after I made some changes, learning some stuff from researching this video. Her tweed jacket said everything you needed to know about her. A haphazard patchwork of spite and unorthodoxy. It wore its age with pride and seams sewn and re-sewn times over. Her keys slacked around a large ring as she strode, a giant shorter than me. It was the rattle you hear before you're told it's time to walk from the dungeon to the blocks. In both versions, I use that limper and eye patch technique by focusing on a particular feature, her jacket, that distinguishes her from other characters. Uh, the story is also told from a first-person perspective, so I wanted to add in a line that uses my perspective character's biases. They very much admire and respect this woman, so they would characterize her as a giant despite her height. I also really wanted to strengthen the words and verbs that I used. Strode is much more visceral than walked, and it communicates something of the woman's confidence. So yeah, I think that this new description tells us more about who she is, and it does more showing rather than telling now. And I also want to read to you a short piece that I am kind of proud of, uh, looking back after this video. Alice needed my help up the slope. I gripped at her forearm and she mine, and her chestnut skin felt like memories, coarse in the palms from handiwork while the rest was driftwood, warped in shade and texture by acid burns from our experiments. They were battle scars always on display. Basically, I'm trying to show you how I'm using my research to improve my writing as well. Partly because it's good to, I want to get more used to showing my writing publicly, but also because I get pretty freaked out by the standard that people are going to hold my writing to coming out of all of this. It's pretty scary sometimes, and I want to show you that I am also always trying to improve my writing as well. As I said at the beginning, I studied over 30 great character descriptions for this video, but we only covered a handful of these today. And uh, if you want the extra analysis that I put together, then it's available to all patrons. It's got extra analysis on all of these books, as well as books that we didn't even get to cover today, and some of the best analysis I feel. Links are all down in the description below if you want to support me and get access to all this. But, summary time. 1. Vivid character descriptions often highlight one or a few distinguishing physical features, sometimes contrasting it with the same feature in other characters. Vivid descriptions are careful with word choice. Rather than stating facts, they use words that give extra connotations that also describe the character. 2. Posture, movement, and facial expressions can be even more important to physical description than hair, eyes, or body shape. They are often more useful in fast-paced scenes where characters are introduced. Three. The best physical descriptions tell us about who the characters are, their psychological state, their flaws, their worldview, their personality, their thought patterns, and more. Consider not just your character's distinct visual features, but features that come from those quirks, those flaws, strengths, struggles, and beliefs. Four, the bias of the perspective character can impact how others or themselves are described and characterize the narrator in doing so. Consider how your character's feelings affect how they describe something, especially in first person or third person limited. 
Fifthly, character descriptions can also tell us about the story around them, relationship, setting, world building, or even theme. This is often through juxtaposition and comparison. The character's arc may shape what they focus on in others at the start and end of the story. And six, some structural techniques include the whiplash effect, juxtaposition, and highlighting a special characteristic in its own sentence. But that's all from me. Man, I love doing these more technique focused videos. Let me know what you guys want to see more of in the future down below. Check out that Patreon stuff. In the meantime, stay nerdy and I will see you in the future.